I think we're going to get started. Everybody ready? Yeah. Everybody with their coffee, wherever you are? <laughs> okay, welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us, whether you're sitting at home or sitting in room 324. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. We know that these uh, summer plus hybrid are complicated, right? Especially a whole day. So these are. It's a serious group. Anyway, I'm Marcy Campos. I'm the director of our Center for Community Engagement Service, which for those who don't know is on the second floor of this building. So we always welcome to come and visit. And um, been at AU quite a few years and have been both a practitioner of community-based learning and also a big advocate for making this a reality on our campus. And it's taken a bit, but I think we're making some serious uh, the word progress <laughs> heat and some traction these days, some traction so. absolutely so i want to have my co-leaders introduce themselves and then we'll do intros by everybody else and then we will let you know what the agenda is going to look like and could you hold up the packet if anybody who's not here in person would later on like a hard copy of the packet we made some extras so we'll be happy to send it to you mm. oh, no. Oh, got it, got it, got it. You're right. <laughs> We're going to have to keep moving the camera around. Good point. Okay. Well, this is our packet. And if later on, Sagar sent it to you, but if you do want a hard copy, we're happy to put it in the mail and get it to you. Okay. Amanda and then Sagar. All right. Uh, I'm Amanda Chaka, she, her pronouns. I'm a senior professorial lecturer in the Department of Literature, teaching the Writing Studies program. I also teach an A4 complex problems course. Uh, I am also a faculty fellow uh, in the Center for Community Engagement and Service, working on the Working with Washington initiative. Uh, it's part of Strategic Initiative 7 strategic plan. Uh, so myself and my graduate assistant, Kyle, who's not here today, we basically work to support community-based learning and research on the faculty and the student side, looking at different types of faculty development, student support. Sorry, someone else was just showing okay. Um, Thank you. Faculty support, student support, and different ways that we can be supporting community partners and reimagining community-based learning across the university. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Sagar Gupta, and uh, I work in the Center for Community Engagement Service as well as the coordinator of community-based learning and research. I attended American University uh, have as a double eagle and have a certificate in community-based research from um, from the certificate program was also in the community-based research scholars program so uh, really excited to join back into this team and this work i manage a few different programs which we'll go over uh, later on they're all ones around student engagement with community-based learning either inside of the classroom as a tangential component to the classroom or around student achievement whether it's getting grants to do community-oriented projects or uh, getting recognized for volunteer work that students are already doing Great. Right. So I think we'd like to just, it's not a huge group, but we'd like to know who you are, you know, maybe name, what, whether you're staff or faculty, and if there's like a sentence about what makes you want to take this session, that would be super helpful too. So should we start with our in-person people? Alyssa. Great. So my name is Alyssa Carvin. Excuse me one sec. So can the camera go on her while she's it doing is, her yeah. intro? Oh, it is. Okay, perfect. Great. Um, um, so my name is Melissa Carmen. I am a first year instructor advisor, so I teach AUS 1 and 2 and advise first year students. And I'm here, I'm new, I'm mostly here to learn more about how this is a program and this grant, like growing at AU to help incoming students figure out where to get involved. So you also get to meet a lot of people because yes. you probably haven't met that many yet, yes. right? That's the other secret reason. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not it. Hi everybody, I'm Jason Fabricant, he him, uh, pronouns. I teach in the School of Public Affairs, Department of Justice Law and Criminology. I teach a course called uh, Critical Issues of Justice. I'm teaching a couple sections of that in the fall, and I am learning, uh, wanting to learn more about it. It's been a while since I've had a, an ad hoc credit for community-based learning, so I really want to get that uh, moving this summer so it's ready for the fall. So that's my main goal here. Great, yeah. thank you. And Jason is a long time practitioner. It's, you're not new to this at all. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Renzo. I'm an assistant professor in the psychology department. Um, 
My research is mostly around parent, parent mental health and early child parenting. And I'm interested in both community based research and learning a little bit more about the partnerships that already exist kind of at AU to kind of build the lab with that way. And then hopefully incorporating some more into courses as I start prepping the courses for the first year. So, are you new also, or you've been here a while? I've been here a year. One year. Wow. Great. Did you use community based learning in the past at previous I, institutions? I've done it as a grad student, but never the last grad. Sense. Oh, good. Well, I'm sure you can teach us something then, too. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Vicki Marchand. I'm a reference librarian at the library. Um, we do support the uh, writing program, so I do a little bit of instruction there. Um, but mostly I'm here because as a DC native, I'm very passionate about the learning that goes on off campuses and um, how important that can be in the career of AD Great. Oh, and I started last time. Perfect. Later on, I'm going to connect with you on our Explore DC program. So it's a different one. Hey, thank you. Okay, who's going to go online? Who's going to go first? Noemi, you want to start? Sure. I thought Jeff was on muting. Jeff, were you ready? Uh, you go ahead. Go ahead. I tried to figure out the, the system. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi everyone, my name is Noemi Chautegui de Jesus. I also work in a department of psychology, so I'm so pleased to see a couple of my colleagues here, Nicole in person and John, I see you here online. Um, and I am delighted to see the, the participation in this institute uh, every year. And I appreciate Marcy and the team with Amanda and Sagar. Uh, doing this with us. So I, I teach a community psychology class and I also am the faculty director for the community-based research scholars program. And I'll tell you more about those things a little later. Okay, thank you. Jeff, you ready? Yeah, good morning. Uh, Jeff Wang. Uh, I'm a, a vice provost of global and immersive studies and uh, um, also a faculty member uh, at the School of Education. Uh, part of my research is um, on the international student mental health issues, and so I'm here um, basically as a learner to try, try to uh, learn how AU op offer opportunities for our students to engage community learning and the service learning uh, with the local communities. Great, thank you. Jonathan, you want to go? Sure. Uh, my name is John Tubman. I'm a faculty member in the psychology department. I'm a developmental psychologist by training. My research program is very applied. And um, <clears throat> this year, I developed a couple of new courses in developmental psychology oh. for our undergraduates and um, in adult development and aging and a lifespan course. And I'm trying to, I, my purpose in attending this uh, workshop today is to um, with the themes of the courses being so applied, I would really like to learn how I can partner with community agencies to create a community community based learning component for those classes. Okay, great, thank you. Tihana. Good morning, all. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I teach project management as an adjunct at School of Public Affairs, uh, and actually my first class, summer uh, classes tonight, so I might have to drop out uh, a little bit later today. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, I'm just hoping to learn about community-based learning at uh, AU as a part of May faculty workshops. I found them extremely useful. Um, as an adjunct, I haven't had uh, a lot of professional training uh, before starting my course. This is my third uh, semester of teaching. Great. Uh, teaching project management. So um, thanks, it's uh, great to be here. Great, thank you so much. Okay, did we cover everybody? I believe so. All right. We miss anybody. Okay. That is the CTRL, so. Yeah, CTRL, so. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, I think we're ready to transition then into our agenda. You have a hard copy and it's on the screen and we sent it out. So hopefully one, one way or another, you can look at what we hope to do and a little bit of the schedule. 
Go ahead, Sagar. Yeah, so just walking through it, uh, we've already completed the welcome, just the introductions for everybody. Next, we're going to go into community-based learning. What is it the from a theoretical perspective? How do we see this applied, generally speaking, in practice? Then moving into a bit more of how it looks at AU. Why is it important to AU as an institution who prides itself on experiential learning opportunities? What are our different models that we currently offer at AU? We have sort of three different buckets that we'll go through. Uh, this would be really helpful, whether you're a teaching class or if you're an advisor and looking, what are the ways that students can get engaged um, depending on where they're at at AU currently? Then we will go through an interactive activity together, a stakeholder analysis activity. Uh, this will be something we do in the room as well as over Zoom, and we'll divide it to breakout groups then. Uh, we'll move on into a panel with faculty. Uh, so we'll have two faculty joining us, Amanda, who is here in the Department of Literature, as well as Melissa Hawkins from Public Health. And then finally, uh, kind of during this lunch portion as well, we'll have up on the screen um, some ways some different types of service or uh, applied community-based learning methods that we uh, we usually work with. Okay, Marcy. Okay, well, I think actually this is you, this is me. Okay, you go for it. Well, this is kind of the definition we use of community-based learning. And again, on some campuses, they're more commonly using service learning. We like the sound of community-based learning, but they're really interchangeable. And so sometimes, you know, some young people come from high school and they, they better understand the term service learning. It sounds more direct. But basically, it's academic course-based pedagogy that extends and deepens classroom learning through meaningful involvement with a nonprofit, a community agency, or a school. And also sometimes like the city government. Sometimes we have people working like the mayor's office on African affairs or Latino affairs. So that, that sort of counts in, the, in that grouping. And it is a planned collaboration. The idea is really that all the stakeholders have a voice. It's, it's very much a kind of a horizontal relationship and re reciprocity is very important. And it's not just good for our students and their resumes and their future jobs, but the nonprofit you know, should be shaping it and also benefiting strong, strongly from it. So, you know, we, we like structure and obviously we're going to talk today a lot about how to structure it into a syllabus. But, you know, critical thinking and reflection are important and very much that theory and reading and all those things that school is about are important, but it's really about the applied learning that deepens learning. And from our experience, years later, when students are out of college and they look back on their experience, it's that applied learning that sticks with them. So. And I think you probably heard some of these different terms and they're, they're slightly different. So service learning, again, same as community-based learning. Community service is just more, okay, let's volunteer for a day. Let's go feed people, you know, on MLK day of service. Field education, I guess is more like a practicum where you're, it's part, it's part of a class or part you get credit for it, but it's applied learning, but they don't use, you know, the term community-based learning for that. Volunteerism, just sort of a broad general term about volunteering that we, we tend to not use that much. And then obviously an internship at AU is structured and overseen by the Career Center. And just as a little side note, AU is highly, highly recognized for internships. Like, you know, at all the preview days, we're always saying how many students have internships. You know, obviously we're DC, so it's an incredible array of opportunities here. But we strongly believe that community-based learning is equally valuable or valuable in other complementary ways. And so we're trying to get AU to recognize service learning, community-based learning in the same way that internships are recognized. And then finally, this slide is a little hard to read, but I um, can't even see it. Let me put my glasses on. But anyway, sometimes you hear the term high impact practice, and usually that, refers to different kinds of practices. Can you scroll, get the top one a little bigger? I really can't, cannot see it. But um, it's usually what helps retain students or keep students in school and wanting to continue. So those are you know, some of the attributes of high impact practices. And on the list, when you look at research about higher ed, 
community-based learning is one of the high impact practices as are like living learning communities. That's another example of a high impact practice. And then at the bottom, you know, we often talk about the characteristics of different generations. And this is one of the things that people say for Generation Z, if you can generalize that very much about purpose and causes, and therefore it, this could potentially be a draw and a good match for the generation that's in college now. Okay. So how many people are feel kind of connected to the AU strategic plan? Is anybody like on any of the committees or feel like you're following it? Some of those things we get many emails about, mm -hmm. but yeah. It's it's the last that it's done strategic. <laughs> done by change making, change makers for a changing world. That's the uh, app name for yeah. the strategic plan. Yeah, and I put that out on the table. So. There's a number of components of the strategic plan that we feel intersect with the work we're doing. Scholarship, capital, <laughs> learning, obviously, and the biggest one is community. And under community, we have inclusive excellence, you know, the whole work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Working with Washington, Amanda and I are on the committee that's basically pushing a lot of these issues in the Strategic Imperative 7, as you mentioned, and of course, partnerships. So I guess what we're trying to say is we, couch a lot of our advocacy for this kind of involvement in the fact that AU is saying this is part of our strategic plan. We don't want to be this isolated group up in Tenley Town or Spring Valley. We want to be very immersed in the city and the issues affecting residents in the city. And AU faculty and staff have been practicing community learning for years, but it's only in recent years, probably the last two years, uh -huh. we finally have more fiscal support, um, more expansive support, especially from the president's office. Uh, mm -hmm. So the Working with Washington Initiative, we have a slide later on that shows you the budget, um, but we have a $30,000 budget to support community-based learning across the university, and that covers everything from transportation to community partner honorariums, um, faculty micro-grants, so things if you need food for finals or presentations, community partners, student projects, materials for projects with partners, we finally have the support. And it sounds like we're getting more support from the university, so. Okay, next slide. So we just wanna hone in on two particular partnerships where we are very involved. Has anybody heard of the Latin American Youth Center Career Academy? Oh, fantastic, oh, so excited. How have you heard about it? Or anybody on screen, how have you heard about it? I heard about it through my Okay, <laughs> great. Vicky? Vicky said that. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I support them physically. And uh, when Lori Kaplan came to speak at something maybe 20 years ago, I knew that. <laughs> oh my gosh, she's one of my close friends. That's a riot. That is great. Actually, Latin American Youth Center and Latin American Youth Center Career Academy are two different things. So Lori is LAYC, but it's a spinoff. This charter school, which serves about 110 mostly immigrant young people from many countries, although largely Central and Latin, Latin America, is a charter school that's been around for a while, located right in Columbia Heights at 16th and Park. And we have developed what we call two signature partnership, which, which basically means relationships with nonprofits that aren't just kind of one course here, one course there, but across campus, deeper ongoing relationships. And we're also always looking courses and programs. So yeah, if any of you are listening to this and say, oh, that sounds like something that would be a good match for my students, let us know later on because we'd be happy to talk to you. So I'm just gonna run through quickly what it's looked like in the past year or two. Uh, Sorry about that, everybody. Sorry, I meant to, the mic, to do the mic drop later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we've, we've tried to connect the school with different both cohorts, programs, and individual students. And this is what it's looked like. Um, CAS lead did some workshops on college readiness and then actually got an Eagle Endowment grant and brought 
about 10 students to campus to do a tour and eat in TDR and get some AU paraphernalia just to expose them to college life. Uh, Noemi will talk later on about her program because they've done several community-based research um, projects with her students with that particular school. Um, the, the community documentary class in the School of Communication has made several films. The students make like eight minute videos about their staff or their students. Uh, the law school has gotten super involved because many of the students at that school are recent arrivals and are trying to figure out what is their path, not only to college, but to getting some kind of documentation so they can feel comfortable in this country. So they've done a lot of Know Your Rights workshops. A uh, co-guy has done some peer advising and then more recently, Ernesto Castaneda, who heads up the Immigration Lab and the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies, had like a two-day forum and actually invited the principal and three of her students to speak about their experience as recent immigrants and not only what life is like and what, what, what studies are like for them and what are their challenges, but also how could AU help them <laughs> in some way that would be significant? So this has been a wonderful partnership and it will continue into the coming year. I think uh, Noemi also wants to add in how CBRS has been involved. Okay. Yeah. I think we plan to do that with your next slide. Is that right, uh, Server? Yes. Great. All yeah. right. On the left is the, the panel by the principal and her students and Noemi will talk about the picture on the right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so the picture on the right are students from the Community-Based Research Scholars Program that we call CBRS. And these are students that conducted research this spring. Uh, and this picture is from the presentation uh, during finals week when they shared the results of data analysis and the project they completed with the English Language Learners Program. So in this particular year, our focus was on talking through interviews, focus groups, and also surveys, trying to find out what these students in that program who are recent immigrants, what are the ways in which the academy can support their growth and development and in three areas, three things that this immigrant students are navigating. One is academics, of course, because this is the purpose of the school. So these students are here to advance their academic goals. So how is the academy supporting that and what else can they do? The second area was how is the academy helping them navigate the cultural transition and the cultural integration um, so that they can still maintain their culture, but then learn about their new cultural environment. And the third piece was to uh, find out how the academy can support them in their immigration uh, related needs that are mostly about legal needs, which is what Marcy was referring to earlier, where we already have a partner in the College of Law, of Law excuse me, that comes to, um, the academy to support them with counseling on what their legal uh, paths could be. So the students collect the data on those issues and share them with uh, the staff uh, and Sagar uh, was there and Marcy. So thank you for coming and joining us that day to do that. And so what I want to say about that is that this is the second project we do with the academy. Last year, a different cohort of students in the program did a study with students across the academy to find out what kinds of changes uh, the students are looking to see in the programming that is offered. And this was the research um, objective that the executive director, Nicole Hanrahan, asked us to conduct because she wants to figure out what are new things the academy could be offering and what would be uh, the best ways to meet the students' needs. So um, in general, this is the kind of thing that Marcy was talking about when, uh, Marcy, you said earlier, this is high impact, right? High impact practices. And this program, CBRS, is putting together the living learning community. These students live together when they come in in their first year. So they are living together in the dorms. They're taking some of their classes together. 
that are around community-based work as well and service. And they um, are doing this high impact practice of community-based learning and research. So uh, I encourage you in the audience, if you are interested in research and would like to consider the possibility of teaching in the spring uh, for the program, what we have is a community-based research course in the spring and we welcome the opportunity to have faculty joining us to teach one of the sections of that course. And in the course, what you would do is uh, teach them about community-based participatory action research and then lead them in the conduct of research with a community partner of your choice. Um, so please let me know if this is of interest to you for the future. Thank you. And I'll, I'll join back later. Thank and you. I just wanted to add into with the Community Based Research Scholars Program, just how kind of impactful it is and unique as an experience. It's one of those ones that having participated it within it my first year and been a program assistant, the retention rates within the program are really high. It's one that matures, I think, the development of students, not only on this research path, but in terms of getting used to the city, getting used to AU as an institution, the living learning community component of it, the skills that you gain and actually getting a certificate to conduct research, and then going with your class to the site to actually do the research, talk with the community partners there, talk to the community. It's just such a unique experience. And I think one that highlights community-based learning as a whole, but really focuses on that research component. And I think without that, uh, without that part of research, sometimes the academia can get lost in terms of, well, why do faculty go for PhDs? Why are they doing original research? How is it like there's already so much written currently? How is this expanding upon something that is not there in, in books? And it's by saying, OK, we can apply this kind of method to individual communities, create recommendations and make a, a real impact using research. Uh, the, the slogan being research into action uh, as one that I, I really stuck with me. Um, and just a, a great program. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. All right, you want me to do this one? Okay. Um, so one of our other partnerships, uh, signature partnership is with Martha's Table. It's started out primarily as a meal program uh, on 14th Street back in the day. Their headquarters is now in Ward 8 in Anacostia. Uh, and there's some other nonprofits that we partner with regularly. They have programs that focus on primarily food services, um, meal programs, community markets. They also do community markets at different elementary schools and community sites. Um, they have a Head Start program. Um, our students cannot volunteer with that program because there's different regulations on that. Uh, they also have a program called Martha's Outfitters. So we have a number of different groups at the university that are partnering with Martha's Table. For instance, Laura Hinson's uh, community documentary class for the last two or three years has worked with Martha's Table, students have partnered with different community members to create documentaries, short documentaries we attended weeks ago. They were fantastic. Uh, my own writing class in the spring, students get to choose from three to four community partners. They chose Martha's Table. Uh, this generally worked best for students that had, <coughs> sorry, more challenging schedules uh, because there are so many different shifts during the week. So there was a lot of flexibility for students. Generally, students volunteered at Joyful Markets, uh, their Commons Grocery and the Maycroft Market. The Joyful Markets are the markets that are at different sites throughout the community. The Commons Grocery and the Maycroft Market are either at the Martha's Table headquarters in Anacostia or at the Maycroft building on 14th Street, in Columbia Heights. And they're usually volunteering in small groups based on individual schedules. Uh, School of Education has a number of different partnerships in different capacities. And they're exploring different ways that they can build educational programs for the adult community members through the School of Education. COGOT, uh, they have studied Martha's Table's food distribution model, uh, and they're making recommendations for improved processes with some of the graduate students. Airly, uh, AU's property out of Virginia. Uh, we're currently strategizing to figure out how Airly can become a supplier for Martha's Table. Right now, the food production isn't as high as it needs to be to become an actual supplier but we are currently waiting on some new to be coming in, coming into early, I believe in the next month or so, right? Uh, and they will be, that's one of their 
priorities. And then MLK Day of Service, different student groups. Uh, students can sign up to do MLK Day of Service. And Martha's Table was one of our significant partners. Uh, students went to Martha's Table's headquarters, some of the elementary schools and other nonprofits through the community to help distribute food that day. So do you wanna add anything else here? Martha's right. Table has been a community partner for different AU programs for at least 10 years. And we have a relationship through them or for them through, I believe it's the Dean of the School of Education, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so again, this is another partnership that we're looking to grow. Um, personally, I'm working with a faculty member to figure out how her clothed and justice class, it's a complex problems class, could be partnering with Martha's Table's Outfitters, which is their mm -hmm. closet and possibly AU Walk Trade, because AU also has a closet, so. Uh, so just some pictures. Uh, so students on the, all of our lefts, yes. Are my students, they were volunteering at Joyful Market. So generally the students, Joyful Markets work slightly differently depending on which one it is, um, but generally the students come in and they work with one person individually. So if Alyssa and I were working together at Joyful Market, I might walk down the line with her and make sure that she gets two of everything. The rule at Martha's Table is every community member can get two. So if you're a parent who comes in with two children, you could get two, two, two. Um, so students generally, there's a moment where there's a bit of awkwardness. They don't like having to say like, well, you can't have three of this, but your kid can have two or this. Um, so it's been an exciting experience for my students. Um, they've learned some new communication skills. Uh, they've learned how to work some challenging moments. And then AU's Child Development Program uh, through School of Education. They now have 104 students and they're graduating their first cohort in 2023. Uh, do you want anything more on that program? No. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. And then what we're trying, you know, as you can see, we're looking at different ways to elevate this work, both because we think it's important for AU in the city, and also we know it's extra labor. I mean, for a faculty member to take this on, it, it is more work to, you know, reach out to the partner and make sure meaningful experiences occur. So one of the ways we do that is through a recognition and awards, like nominating faculty for awards, as you can see, we did for Amanda. Um, we had Laura Henson also recently got an award. Amanda's award was actually from the nonprofit. That was so cool. So she went to a ceremony and got recognized for her long, long-term commitment to supporting kids. Uh, Laura Henson recently got the Outstanding Community Engagement Award. Unfortunately, we only have one, but we were the ones who promoted it and got it like three years ago. So maybe at some point we'll get like one for grads and one for undergrad classes. Um, we have a in our office, what's called the MLK Visionary Award. And we give an award to an AU alum who's working with a nonprofit community in DC and that their organization gets like $700 and there's a nice ceremony. So that's something we've also got started a couple of years ago with support from Gemma Puglisi's PR portfolio class as a recommendation. And then we have a student who's part of a network where we're part of Transform in Atlantic. And this year, Josie Von Fisher is the civic fellow. That's like a training, so. But um, yeah, we, we recognize that for a lot of people and for this institution, you know, these kinds of recognitions add importance and value. So, and especially as AU is reimagining the reappointment and promotion process for term faculty mm -hmm. and starting to recognize how community-based research and participatory research matters into the tenure process also, mm -hmm. we think this is something to highlight. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. So as we move into community-based learning models, I'm actually going to stand up where we'll spend just to give everyone an outlook of time. Uh, we'll have a stretch break in about, um, so we'll do this next portion in terms of models of community-based learning at AU, talk through a few of the different opportunities and programs that we run within the Center for Community Engagement and Service uh, for about 20 minutes. Then we have an interactive activity for about uh, 25 minutes. Between those two, we will do a five-minute stretch break and give everyone just a chance to, um, to take a break if they need it, if that sounds good for everyone. And one of the things I just wanted to highlight about all of those recent slides is that we, we saw with the two partnerships, LEYCCA and Martha's Table, the amount of, uh, of support across schools. And I think this interdepartmental support is something that's really fascinating to see. We saw School of Communications, COGOD involved in multiple of those, as well as School of Education and CAS. So 
we see it across different schools, across different programs. And one of the reasons why is I think we really try and make this something that's accessible uh, regardless of school or what you're teaching, because we believe that community-based learning is a high impact practice that any faculty could uh, use to further their learning. Two of the things I just wanted to mention, and we can, uh, we'll get into this more in later slides is, kind of curious, does anybody know off the top how many nonprofits are in or nonprofit organizations or educational institutions are in the DC area? I guess DC Central? DC itself. Yeah. And we can do a Price is Right style game where it's like, just toss out one, I'll say higher or I'll, you know? I'm just tossing out a number. A thousand? Higher than a thousand. Let's get one from, from the Zoom if uh, somebody wants to say. Just a number higher than a thousand. How many nonprofits are in DC? What do we think? Yes, somebody. So hint, DC is unofficially the nonprofit capital of the United States. <laughs> yeah, and potentially the world. Honestly, it's it's quite a few. Anyone from online want to uh, give a guess? Three thousand. Three thousand. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, a little bit higher. Let's go back over 4, here. Four higher. We're. I'll give a hint. We're uh, five digits. Oh, yes. Oh, Jeff said, Tahana said 10,000. 10,000, a little bit higher than 10,000. We're getting close, though. All right, I will I'll spoil the surprise. We have about 14,000, and it's growing every time. Uh, I checked the numbers, nonprofits in the DC area, or sorry, in the DC proper. When you look at the DC area, that even goes up tremendously. Um, so all that to say that there are enough nonprofits that need the support um, that we can work with and collaborate with, create partnerships, depending on whatever it is that your class is teaching or uh, that you have students interested in. So knowing that there's also so many nonprofits, it begs the question, well, how many of these nonprofits are employing those who stay in DC and live in DC? And this is to me, uh, something that's really fascinating having been in the executive recruitment space before, there's, over 25% of the DC workforce is employed by nonprofits in the city. So oftentimes we have students who are coming thinking, well, where do I go after college? What is my steps there? And it's oftentimes not something that's spoken about on our college campus. We have, uh, we push the corporate internships, the government internships, since we're in DC and the capital. One of the things that I think is a huge opportunity for students, especially at these entry level positions, to get a lot of experience, a breadth of experience, and to delve into an issue that they might want to make a difference in is community based learning. And so I'm really happy to uh, that AU offers a few of these community based learning offerings. And again, we've tried to do this in ways that, uh, regardless of the course that you're teaching or the way that you would love students to get involved, we hope to provide that. So the first is the community service learning program. And one thing I just want to state up front is that oftentimes the community based or sorry, the community service learning program and the community based learning courses are uh, are oftentimes confused. It makes sense. They both sound similar and they both are similar in intent. The main way to think about it is that the community service learning program or CSLP is an add on credit. It's a one credit pass fail option that students can add on to a course of their choosing. Uh, it could be added onto almost any course. We work with the registrar directly to register that student. So oftentimes we get that question from the students or from the faculty, how does that registration work? From a student's point of view, they don't have to go into Eagle service. They don't have to add in or register a credit separately. The credit is free if they are a full-time student and are within kind of the 12 to 16 and a half credit um, we don't recommend Rage. offering students if they have 16 and a half or more credits because they don't have to pay for the credit. Yeah, and we have had some students actually within the last year who have opted to pay for the credit. We have actually one who's a summer student right now who is paying for it because especially within departments like psychology, there are experiential learning credits that are required and there are other certificate programs that require a uh, CSL key add-on credit. So oftentimes, or maybe not often, but occasionally we do have students who will add on and pay for this, even if their uh, workload or credit load is, is at max or if they're doing something over the summer. So this one credit pass-fail option 
can be attached to a course. I mentioned it's something that we handle with the registrar. What it looks like for you on the faculty end is a minimal commitment. That's, that's what we're hoping to do is we take the student, we run an orientation, we assign them a peer mentor who works with them, uh, does monthly check-ins with them throughout the semester. And it's something that's really guided more through our program. The student is their own kind of leader. It takes a student who is willing to have a separate Canvas course and uh, for CSLP track their hours more so on their own versus the community-based learning course. So CV courses, as we call it, which are a list of about 15 to 25 courses currently that we offer every semester. These are across different departments and these are what can be found on Eagle Service. Um, there's actually a really quick way, and I I'll do it. might do a screen share. Oh, uh, I got it. Maybe during the middle. I know that that's not going to reflect up on here, though. No, I'm screen sharing. Oh, OK, perfect. So within Eagle Service, you can uh, check off a filter, search for any community-based courses. So this is something that we're hoping to outline in some in a video uh, or to speak with first-year advisors about how would students uh, find community-based courses. These are courses where the partnership with a nonprofit organization or educational institution has been tied in to the learning objectives of that course and to the structure of the course. So it could be a project-based course, it could be an hours-based course, and I'll go into mo both of these uh, offerings, the CSLP add-on credit and the community-based courses um, over the next few slides as well. So, so as you see what's going on right now. Yep, and I wanna add one thing, a good way to think about it, community-based learning courses, the entire class is participating. It does have to meet the eight criteria that we'll share later. It does have to go through the approval process with CSS, and it does have to be coded as a CBL class with the registrar's office. I'm going to pass around the full CV list. CSLP is an add-on that students can opt into. So often, again, this is where Sager's point and the people, even professors, still get confused at this point. A whole class can be doing CV, and someone could do CSLP on top of that, but the entire class does not have to do CSLP on top of that. So if you wanted to see all the community-based learning courses at the university, I wish this was Showing better, but see there. And these are all the fall courses. So, for instance, in complex problems, we have, I think, three, five total. We have quite a few in public health, three in class, yoga class. Psych 322. Oh, there's Jonathan. Uh, SIS, Spanish translation. This is always popular with community based learning. And that looks like. Yeah, and then if we go. I'm sorry. And yeah, question 50. Well, and, and this may be part of where the confusion lies. So I thought all complex problems fit under the category of experiential learning. Yes. And that is different from what yes. you're talking about. Yes. Exactly. I will explain yeah. a little bit of that because one of my CB classes is complex problems. So there's a learning outcome for complex problems that is integrative learning. So they should be connecting what they're doing to the classroom, to the DC community or other communities, but it's different based on each class. But I'm glad you brought that up because I think we did it mention early on the other big area that AU is moving is experiential learning. They want to be known as part of the identity is experiential. So under the umbrella of experiential, one way you can pursue that is community-based learning. There are many other ways like internships and AU abroad and all that stuff. But yeah, that's another way we advocate and say, yeah. <laughs> Alyssa, this co-god class marketing for social change is super popular. So new careers teaching. That's that's of course. Yeah, I'll be working with the students. So Got it. They won't take these when way. I work with them, but it's yeah. Got it. But you can see why for advisors it's so important to, to know this so that mm -hmm. as students set up their schedules, they know it's an option. We were in a presentation like two weeks ago for some students in SIS course, and they were but they were seniors and said, I wish I had known as a first year student, like we don't, we don't have enough visibil visibility, but we don't want people to look back and say, wow, I missed out on the opportunity to do CSLP or CB class because I just didn't know. Um, I actually, because I teach first year students, talk with advisors regularly. Uh, and I probably get at least 
one to two messages every semester asking about the differences between the classes. So at some point, we would like to chat more with you all. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, and I think part of it is, you know, we'll, we keep doing things like this. And as we have more who are involved as almost advocates or supporters of community-based learning, hopefully these, uh, uh, the, the intentionality behind the programs and why they're kind of offered separately um, are made clear. So to go into a little bit more on the leadership side, this is where we offer uh, two other programs. So the President's Volunteer Service Award is something that's actually run by the Office of the President of the US, the same office that would handle things like medals of uh, valor or honor. What they've done is open up one for anybody, really. It doesn't have to be students or those under you know, 25 or 18 uh, to get recognized for doing, for being exemplary citizens and committing to volunteer work. So the AU Board of Trustees, as well as uh, the Office of the President of the US, accredited AU as an organization to distribute the President's Volunteer Service Award, or PVSA, as we call it. Uh, in November of last year. So originally we were thinking about April as being our kind of like launch date. We actually moved it up and had our first cohort go through, uh, graduating in as a senior this last May, or I guess this month. So we had about four or five students go through, uh, receive a medal. So sorry, backtracking just a second. In order for a student to be eligible for the President's Volunteer Service Award, they need to do a minimum of 100 hours of community service. The Office of the President defines what counts or is eligible as community service. So certain things like uh, uh, volunteering where there's a political component and you're advancing a political agenda or where you're advancing a religious agenda are uh, not counted. But if you're doing things that are more general or apolitical or just working for a church and doing maybe more of a food program, something like that, those do count. So when we talk about both the CSLP and the community-based learning courses, both of those have our hours requirement, which I'll get into into the next slide. The hours that you're, that students are doing for either of those two count towards the President's Volunteer Service Award. And we use this nifty tool called Give Pulse to track those hours, to ask uh, nonprofits to verify and approve those hours. And that's the way that we track who receives a President's Volunteer Service Award. So what do they get when they uh, receive the award? They are put onto a special alumni list. Upon graduation, we try and do a service event that ties everybody together and gets everyone a chance to meet each other. It's a distinguished honor. So you get a signed letter from the President of the United States, a certificate, a medallion you get to wear during graduation, and, um, and it's a great, opportunity or uh, kind of a great accomplishment to put on your resume or anything like that. The Eagle Endowment is a separate program that's focused on giving grants of up to $1,000 to students, whether they're graduate level students or undergraduate level students, individuals or clubs, to do a community oriented project that creates real change or transformative change in the DC uh, community. It was started after 9-11 in 2001 by the classes of 2001 and 2. They actually combined their class gift, did fundraising with alumni and with local Tenley Town businesses, and created the first student-led endowment initiative in the US. So we raised $100,000, put it that principal balance into an account, and then uh, that endowment, we use the interest that comes off of that account to fund these community-oriented projects. So a really astounding model, one that's sustainable, one that has been around for 20 years and actually in 2017 won top college philanthropy in the US. It's one that we've seen really amazing uh, projects come out of. I'll briefly mention um, two of them and I actually might have another slide that I do that Jason, in. Jason, your students always apply. For SPA leadership, right? Yeah, they apply for grants regularly. Yeah. They're yeah. like the yeah. biggest population yeah. to dip into it. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 130 strong, so pretty, pretty big cohort. I can see it. Yeah, but the largest. Are you serious? Yeah. But spread over four years, 130. Four years. Uh, how many are coming in in the fall? Uh, it's going to be a class of about 25, so okay. a little bit smaller than normal, but yeah. Oh. So with the Eagle Endowment Grants, they're given a year to use that funding. They are paired with a mentor who is able to work with them to uh, implement the project. And one of the best things about the Eagle Endowment is that you can just start with an idea. 
And even if you know, hey, I want to get involved on within food insecurity within the DC community, but I don't really know where to go. By the time you finish the application, you do a research analysis, uh, uh, identifying stakeholders, proposing a budget, creating a timeline. So you are putting a full on project proposal on the table, which is then reviewed by the advisory council, which is made up of students, undergraduate and graduate students. So students can not only apply for grants, but they could apply to be on the council to do events like fundraising, marketing, as well as reviewing the grant applications that come through and mentoring the project. So it's a really exciting uh, kind of program that creates change in the DC area. I'll give two examples really quickly. One was done by a, uh, what was a, student who was a member of a fraternity volunteering at a foster home in the DC area, Boys Town, DC. And one of the parts again is to ask the community itself, what is it that uh, you would like to see? And they, he went around asking all of the kids, what's one thing that we could do to make your day-to-day -day experience at this foster home better? This was back in 2018. They said, uh, we have this outdoor basketball court. We wish we had more outdoor recreational um, kind of facilities. Uh, it was a bit run down. And so they worked with the facilities at the foster home, uh, quoted it out at $600, recruited volunteers, and over a two month period actually rebuilt the basketball court um, and insured it for 10 years. So that's a whole generation of youth going through that foster care system who will have uh, access to now a premier facility. Another example is a student who was a volunteer for Teach for America, also identified as LGBTQ. And notice that there was a gap within DC public schools where students would come to their teachers, maybe asking questions about inclusive sex education and teachers not really knowing how to respond. So that student worked with LGBTQ organizations, worked with students and with uh, teachers at DCPS, built a inclusive sex education toolkit. And we were then able to pay to distribute that to every DC public school. So now that's a resource that they have that they can count on to uh, teach students about inclusive sex ed. Um, next, we have more engaged departments of program. So I'll mention a little bit about the CBR certificate program. Before I do, uh, I wanted to ask Noemi if you wanted to mention anything more about the Community-Based Research Scholars Program, CBRS. Sure. So the CBRS program, as I mentioned before, is first year students. So this is a one year program. And the way that uh, community engaged work is incorporated in it is both through the requirement of service. So outside of a class, the students are expected to uh, do community service throughout that year, both semesters. And then the other way is through the courses per se. So they need to take community based courses and we do that through their complex problems classes and also the research class and a lab class. So each semester they have uh, courses that are community-based. And then after that first year, uh, students are able to continue on to completing the certificate, which is what Sagar will, will tell you about. And I wanted to say that if you have students that you know are already at AU, so they're no longer able to join the CBRS program because this is for first year students, you could encourage them to pursue the certificate because they can complete the requirements and still learn about community participatory research um, and get that course and complete the other requirements. So Sagar, uh, up to you now. So you yeah. can tell me more about the certificate. Thank you, Noemi. Uh, the certificate was created as a way that students who are interested in that research component of community-based learning could um, receive a certificate as well as really get hands-on skills. So one of the parts of it, uh, so it's a 15 credit or so certificate, very easy to incorporate into a major. Uh, I'll speak to my own experience within my kind of four years at AU, was able to have a CLEG major, a minor in management leadership, a certificate in applied ethics, as well as a certificate in community-based research. So oftentimes students might get uh, worried, oh, is a certificate almost like a minor or a major? How many extra credits is it? It's only 15. And six of those credits you actually see right here on the screen. The Any of the community-based courses, all of those being three credits, count as one of those, uh, a sixth essentially, or sorry, a fifth of the requirements, as well as the CSLP, that's an additional way to get between zero and three credits towards the certificate. Some of the other things that you take there are two research courses, as well as one that is fully focused on, uh, solely focused on 
community-based research methodology. So it's one that when you're thinking of getting data science skills, if you have students who are interested in data sciences or on the research component, it is one that uh, really behooves them because they can, it's, it's pretty well respected, I think, within the nonprofit community to have a certificate in community-based research, know how to not only set up a research project, but carry it all the way through and analyze the data at the end. So over here, sorry, yeah, I think we're yeah. one slide ahead. Do you want to go back? Yeah, so this slide is on the community service learning program. Again, I mentioned this, so I won't belabor it too much. The only other things I would mention are a bit about the process. So students are matched before the ad drop period. We have we host an orientation, I should say, before the ad drop Can period. Can I add something here? Mm -hmm. Students need to opt in and fill out the paperwork before the end of ad drop because it does have to be registered through the registrar's office, so keep that in mind. Yeah, so the way that that works is uh, through that uh, kind of tool I mentioned, GivePulse. We have a registration form. They fill it out, that gives us all the information. We have the orientation for the fall set for September 6th. And um, if anyone registers, then of course we send out some emails and make sure that they know about it beforehand. But I also wanna say that we, Sagar sends out an email in August to all a huge list of faculty saying, if you want me to come into your class, I can talk about it. Because I think students need to see, unless they're familiar with it, they need to see a face and say, here are nonprofit directories, here are some options, this is what be, a way to apply and get that extra credit in your class. So like if you're going to do it, Jason, like that would be great to have him come in for 10 minutes and talk in the first week of school or maybe the second week, but then it gets tight with the deadline. Yeah, uh, and I'll kind of explain the slide in two ways, one from the faculty point of view, the other from the student point of view. So starting with the student point of view, it's 35 hours of working with a nonprofit over the semester. So working with a nonprofit could be uh, paid work or unpaid work. So we don't um, you know, it, it's not that if somebody is getting paid for the work that they're doing with a nonprofit, they're immediately ineligible for the CSLP. Uh, what will happen, though, is they can't count that towards that president's volunteer service award because it's not volunteer service. So they do 35 hours. They track those hours in Give Pulse. We can help them match to a nonprofit partner if they don't have one in mind or if they're already working with one or have one in mind. We can explore that as an option. Once they've been matched, which we hope to do within the first few weeks of the program, they fill out a uh, kind of a form. It generates a participation agreement, which is sent to the faculty as well as to the nonprofit partner. So everybody is on the same page about what are the expectations of this service learning project. Then they are responsible for, since it is kind of a cohort experience, attending a mid-semester reflection, a service learning workshop to uh, further their skills in service learning and understand it as a pedagogy. And then we do a final kind of reflection at the end to gather some part, uh, program data and one academic reflection. This academic reflection is where the tie-in goes to the faculty component. So we have heard a lot of feedback from faculty and really want to make sure that this is something that uh, faculty can do, even if they have eight of their students engaged within it without it being a lot of extra work for them. So the only real requirement is to grade the student at the end, of course, give the approval at the beginning. And um, the way that the grade happens at the end, we send out instructions before the grade period. Uh, it's actually really simple. We include screenshots and everything. And it's just about there's a separate uh, kind of course. You add in a letter grade that's translated into a pass fail on the back end. So we estimate the overall time commitment being one hour, and the majority of that is actually just looking over or talking to your student about the academic reflection component. We provide a few different ways that they could do the academic reflection. One of the ones that's popular right now is a video log or vlog, uh, where they're answering kind of three questions about their service. What was it like? How was it unique? How did it extend their learning in class? And that's about a two minute video. It's one that students enjoy doing. We try and work with the library actually to do that through their story group uh, in their downstairs area and then we can send it through you through Canvas or Cultura. So on the next slide is the community-based courses. So we have a list of the community-based courses across different schools. The main difference here, again, is that they're, instead of doing 35 hours at an individual level, they're doing 20 hours per person at the class level or a project that is a, a similar project, a service learning project or a community-based, I should say, project. So within GivePulse, that platform, and I'll kind of mention this more in detail later, we offer some ways that faculty is tracking 
of either of these two, whether it's direct service or project-based courses, um, can happen. And yes, I can share more about that Star Booth, Booth Initiative. So that's actually part, of, this past semester was part of something smaller, or sorry, something larger, the Experiential Learning Conference, which brought together experiential learning um, avenues across the university. And part of what we were trying to do, this was uh, tied into our new website launch. So we actually now have a website dedicated to what is experiential learning at AU. And the conference not only kind of helped promote that, but it was also a really great way to get feedback and information about what experiential learning opportunities at AU are like. And um, the story booth was a way to get testimonials from students on how their experiential learning uh, opportunities made an impact in their AU education. So as I was mentioning, it was 20 hours of uh, working within that class. If your student is wanting to do CSLP, that add-on credit, and in a community-based course, we do have it so that they wouldn't have to do 35 hours plus 20 hours. 55 hours is quite a lot to do in a semester. So if a student is tracking up to 45 hours, that would satisfy both requirements. On to the next slide. We published that list on our uh, CSS CBLR page. Again, I can come in and do uh, presentations. And one of the things that's actually within your packet, whether it's the digital packet or the one that you have here, is the difference between those two courses, as well as what is the role of faculty for both of those. So I think I went over this mm -hmm. uh, already. The overall time estimate for CSLP is one hour. CB courses, you apply for the designation for your CB course in advance of teaching it. We invite you to an institute like this. We will be hosting a smaller, uh, a shorter kind of 60 to 90 minute um, overview of how Give Pulse can be used to support your community-based course. There's a lot of cool features there and we have time later to talk about that. So I think that's it over here, keeping up with time. I wanna make sure that we have five minutes of break. Uh, our role of CSS overall, we facilitate the CV course designation. So that's approving it, working with faculty throughout that process to strengthen their syllabi, do presentations to classes, um, connect them with resources and with nonprofit or, uh, partners. And we support students using the Give Pulse platform, answering any questions that they have, and also helping match. And then we manage those nonprofit relationships as well. Oftentimes uh, they're looking for something specific or a longer commitment than maybe that student was originally anticipating giving, and we try and mediate that relationship. You want to add anything yeah. about CSS and CV classes? Yeah. All right. So we want you to do an interactive activity, but we also want to give you a 10-minute break. So the idea here was um, thinking about their different stakeholders and what are the benefits for each, whether it's students, faculty and staff, university or community organizations. So I guess we should decide, is it worth breaking out and doing it or should we just you know, encourage people to verbally share and then we'll, we'll have a break right at 1120. I think that's important because our panel is coming in at 1130. So we wanna stay on track. I know we've been talking a lot. So just how about we just make it more of a conversation we're yeah. going to do in here, like the flip chart and then the jam board online. But for, from your point of view, for students, what is the benefit of this community engagement, community-based learning? Anybody just call out. What are the benefits for students? It brings the learning to life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It brings learning to life. Anybody want to add to that? It certainly complements the in-class learning with going to different sites and mm -hmm. actually, you know, getting immersed in, in your learning and being enriched by yes. with other people collaborating. So. Absolutely. Okay. Anybody else? I think it shows holes within current uh, research too. It's like oftentimes, especially when you're looking at this through a critical race lens or anything like that, oftentimes research that you see or articles that you read take knowledge to hear and you need that extra little bit which mm -hmm. is that like kind of uh, nuance and i think it, it does a good job of at least raising those questions within students yeah and actually i would add to that that you know our students a lot of them 
come from different locations and backgrounds. Not all of them have lived in urban areas. A lot of them haven't even worked, lived, you know, gone to multi-cultural, multi-economic level high schools. So I think getting out in the city is like really that applied diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we like to call it Je Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we really believe that, you know, you can talk on as many panels as you want about DEI, but when you're actually in those situations, and I know because I've heard so much about Amanda students, like this is forces them to think about issues, but how do you work with young people and how did your personal experience shape what you do? Um, so I've been teaching community-based learning courses since 2011, and I think my experience in teaching at AU is probably similar to people who've been here for quite a few years, um, especially I would say around 2015 and exponentially forward. I have students who, are very sure they are not racist in my classroom, who are very equitable, who are very just, um, but have been in very white spaces or very privileged spaces. Uh, and then I have students who have had to think about racism and equity every single day to stay alive, but they are often in our classrooms and living together and working together on campus and in DC. And the kind of learning that they're doing in the community as my students that remind me every semester, like they can learn something from a textbook or reading or even a video. Um, they can do a project, they can do even community-based participatory action research, but it's different when they see it in practice in the community. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this past weekend, I, I went to Ann Arbor where I went, went as an undergrad and one of the students I know very well, Shirley Agraisa from Oregon is doing her master's there. She did her AU undergrad degree here. And we, you know, hooked up for dinner and Shirley said, Marcy, I was ready to leave AU. I did not feel connected there. I was a Latina student from the West Coast. And in the course I took with me, uh, <laughs> Latino community of the DC metro area, I got to work with the CARE Coalition, Capital Area Immigration, uh, what's the R? Rights. <laughs> right. And that connected me to something I feel very, very, you know, passionate about. And I also made my best friend, um, Katia, through through that class and through alternative break. She also led an alternative break trip to the border, to McAllen, Texas, and then later on to, to Mexico. So it's also, you know, connecting with people's identities and their passions more than just some kind of, oh yeah, I use an, I use an ice school, <laughs> you know. Anyway, so that was my very gratifying, obviously, to hear that. So, okay. So, so Marcy, yeah. you are exactly right that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yes. we talk about student belongingness, and uh, uh, I think these courses would allow the student to formulate a bond among themselves, mm -hmm. a small learning group together, and go through these courses and uh, uh, with a lot of practical uh, learning, and that they will make them feel, okay, AU is more than just a, you know, a, a, school in DC, we, we offer a lot more that are connected to the, the community, you know. Uh, so I think it's, it's going to help the retention in, in uh, uh, and their student success in the long term too. So Absolutely. anecdotally, we know community-based learning does support student feelings of belonging mm -hmm. and retention, uh, not just at AU, but in the DC community. We are finally we have questions added to the first year exit survey mm -hmm. and the senior experience survey, correct? Uh, it's still a work in progress. There's a lot of okay. sides there. So I don't want to say anything official, but we are, we are working with on actual yeah. data and ways mm -hmm. to measure this beyond anecdotes yeah. and feel good stories. But I, I think you're right. It's, it's about meaningful experiences, but it's also about creating community and bonding with other people. Because a lot of times students do go with small groups and do this work. So yeah, all those things are very important. And there is data about the connection between the community engagement retention. I have a long annotated bibliography. We just don't really have that data on AU at this moment. And quite honestly, it's about the vulnerability of being out into this field, mm -hmm. right? Like when you're exposed to, hey, there's so much I don't know. And like now I can see at least the gap between how do I make a true difference and where I'm at right now and then you can uh, shape your next few years at AU around that, mm -hmm. which I think is really powerful. And so when you're in this spot where you're vulnerable, you build trust within those who you are going out and serving. With. And I think that also creates that feeling of belonging and um, connection there. Okay, so let's just do a minute on each of the other categories. 
for faculty as a stakeholder, what, what might be the benefit or the challenges for faculty to be engaged in this work? Anybody? We can make research partners that can help you develop yeah. questions mm -hmm. and can help lead their needs. Great. Others? Anybody else on the benefits for faculty? I mean, I will be honest, I even, I felt this way in undergrad after coming back um, from an internship I had in DC, but there's sometimes a dissatisfaction between the siloing, especially at AU, between what is in Ward 3 and the rest of the DC community. And for me, this feels like a more meaningful way to engage in the DC community and teach my students how to be a part of the DC community mm -hmm. without just taking from the DC community. Okay, how about for the university? I think we've named a few ways, but anybody want to repeat or add to that? What's the benefit or the, why, why is AU a powerful stakeholder in this? All about belonging and retention. Yes, the belonging and retention benefit is clearly something AU is very concerned about. Our retention numbers have gone down a bit, so definitely we're looking for new ways to help students feel connected and want to stay here. Well, okay. it's part of the brand. It's always a question, yes. we, is, is that uh, uh, idealism or actual? Yeah. To the extent yeah. that it's actual, it's better. Yeah. Well, you also, part of the brand is students are activists, right? And have great social mm -hmm. awareness. And this actually puts that into practice, right? Okay. So if you think about any university, but especially city-based universities or urban universities, there is almost always community engagement component. Mm -hmm. There is a volunteer component. Mm -hmm. But people are actually now looking at what is more meaningful, substantive engagement with community partners, or are you doing this for just that picture in the mm -hmm. AU catalog, which our students are aware of. Our students mm -hmm. know what voluntourism is. Mm -hmm. They're quite critical of how AU uses mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. And what about for the nonprofit or community organization? I know it's kind of obvious, but anything, anything you could add to why it's a benefit for them or why they're a, an important stakeholder? I've had a lot of students, not a lot, a number of students come in to say, my community organization just wants re access to our research. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we have 600 databases. They're all yours. Cool. Oh, wow, great. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can share your experience actually just on Sunday. Um, one of our partners, Hope Multiply, they hosted their annual uh, fundraising event. And they operate off of a very small staff of five mm -hmm. and do a lot of really amazing work. One of their staff needed to step back because it's a very draining um, world within the nonprofit space. And they actually hired a student uh, who was just involved in the mm -hmm. community service learning program to be that support to essentially help fill in the gaps from when that full-time staff needs to take a step back. So there's also that, and they were so thankful to have students who not only helped and kind of stayed on for a semester, but those who also they could see as people who could get into the space long term and who could leverage their skills that they're what they're kind of learning in class. I just also wanted to mention one other because we do have a one minute on the university side that, you know, I think it's great for all these other stakeholders, but from that like university side as well. When we look at giving back to the university, something that is really important uh, as we go up the chain, the, you know, donations and money side of things legacy gifts are something that happens when um, people feel like the institution that they're giving to is creating long-lasting change. And what better ways to create long-lasting change and change within the DC community than through work like this, through community-based learning and uh, service. Anecdotally on the community organization side, at whatever stage of COVID we're at right now, pretty much every single community organization that we've talked to in the last two years, they've lost a majority of their adult post-college volunteers. So they are looking for different ways to attract volunteers, but they also, they need fresh blood. They need our student support. Mm -hmm. um, but that also means that they have to rethink how they're training volunteers. Yes. But they also realize that young people bring yes. certain skills. Like they, the social media piece is so important now. For, and, and they know that college students are best positioned to offer that to them. So we see a lot of requests for those kinds of skills. Anyway, anybody have any final comments in this section? Anybody online? Okay, we're going to come back at 1130 for our faculty panel. So everybody take a little break, stretch, get some coffee or use the bathroom or 
It ever works. The restroom's all the way on this side of the building. Down the hall down on the, the right. That's right. right. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Is that how you come to the park? We're going to have you come up. Looking forward to hearing the student perspective. That's very exciting. Glad you could be here. So we are basically going to spend a little bit of time now hearing from several faculty members about both what they did, what their students got involved in, what were some of the strengths and some of the challenges. So we have with us, you've already met Amanda already, but we also have Melissa Hawkins, who oversees all the public health undergraduate studies. And we will start with Melissa. Great. And um, I think we want to be pretty informal, so mm -hmm. we can also listen. And then maybe if you have questions right away, we don't have to wait till, you know, we can yeah. do it after each professor if that, if that helps. Or we yes. can do it. Yeah. And we can also do it. Yeah. Feel end. free to um, jump in, interrupt. This doesn't need to be formal. I mean, we have some slides, but we can yeah. take the conversation in whatever direction is, mm -hmm. is most meaningful for you. And our aim is to show you all what different variations and interpretations and practices look like within the community based learning and research field. So we just wanted an array of kinds of programs, whether it was an individual course or part of more of a, a, a degree or cohort. Okay, take it okay, away. Okay, sure. Um, we need to move through this so we can get off the picture now. <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, as Marcy said, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Health Studies and I direct our undergraduate program. So we offer undergraduate degrees in public health and in health promotion um, and a three year accelerated public health scholars program. And so in our public health program, um, at the major and for the accelerated three-year public health scholars program, service learning is really integrated throughout the curriculum. So two of our courses um, are CB courses at the very start of the curriculum with um, introduction to public health for our uh, public health scholars and then public health capstone. I've taught both of those courses, but today I'm going to be talking about public health capstone, um, which is for our seniors and it's the culminating course for um, the major. Um, but I'm happy to talk about intro to public health if, if that's of interest. But the examples that I'm going to be um, giving are from Capstone. So our Capstone course is really um, designed as two parts, uh, service learning with a community partner with project based work and then professional development. So these are seniors, they're about to graduate. The intent of this course is to have experience, real world experience working with a community partner in a way that's really bringing together everything that they have learned in the past four years and applying that to a problem or to an uh, issue that the community partners have identified. So they work together for the entire semester in small groups. So they're in groups of you know, th three, four, five. I found that the sweet spot is really four where everybody is contributing um, equally and um, I identify the uh, partners and work with the partners before the semester starts so that we can really um, identify and right size the scope of the project, not just with the skills that they can bring, how to match the students that they're looking for and those skills, um, but also, you know, these are undergraduates, they're seniors and, and giving examples of the types of work that they've done in the past so that we can just, you know, sort of right size it. But it's 14 weeks, as you know, and they're working in groups and they're seniors, so they accomplish a lot in these projects. So it's teamwork, um, it's project based, and then it's this real world um, experience that they gain working with the partners. The professional development part is what we're doing in the classroom, and that's really to build their confidence and um, how they can communicate the skills that they have when they're going in looking for jobs or applying to graduate school. So certainly the experience that they have in the capstone class is part of that. So how to articulate what they've done, how to translate that into a resume or in interviewing, which we practice. Um, but I also um, have them do a lot of reflection assignments, reflections over the past four years, reflection in, in the work that they're doing in the class. Um, and one thing that they really enjoy is there's a podcast that they listen to. It's called, um, it's Amari Richens. And it's called the Pro Pro Public Health Millennial. And uh, he interviews um, early career um, you know, students that have recently graduated about how they found their first job, 
um, how they decided, you know, where they wanted to go to graduate school. So it's very much relatable to thinking about what career options there are and how they can um, think about their next step with when there isn't a step <laughs> necessarily, you know, for them after they graduate from college that's mapped out the way it has been for the past 21 years of their lives. And so um, that's very, uh, that they really like that because like I said, it's just very early career students that are, you know, or I'm sorry, recent graduates, 21 to 25 years old. Um, so they reflect on that. Um, and then we also have networking built into the class. So the students are working with their partner closely for the whole semester, but then, and this was came from feedback from students to me, they said, well, we didn't really get to meet the other partners. We didn't really get to know the other projects and the other partners. So um, I added in a networking event where you meet with not your partners. So you, so the students that aren't, um, that are working with their partners don't meet with their own partners. They get to meet with the other partners um, and learn about their career path and trajectory, about the um, mission of their organization and, and really just practice those um, networking um, skills. And then um, at the end, the their final presentations. So whatever they have um, developed and delivered to the partner has been you know, determined with the project description. But then all of the part, all of the students and teams present to the class, and um, you know, Marcy and Sagar are invited, and the community partners are invited, and that becomes a networking event for our community partners as well. I can't tell you how many times partners have just, you know, commented to me like, "Oh, it's so nice to be able to meet, you know, Mary Center and talk about what they're doing," because we just so infrequently get the chance to talk about what of the programs that we have there's a lot of overlap and sometimes there's a lot of, um, you know, ideas that come from those conversations when they attend the final presentations. Any questions there on just the structure of the class? Okay. Um, so these are just some of our recent um, community partners um, where um, we often have repeat, <laughs> repeat uh, customers, <laughs> I call it. So we, we repeat community partners because um, by and large, these projects have been uh, very successful. And so the community partners are eager to work with us and our students again. So sometimes they approach us about a project that they wanna build on that we've done previously. Sometimes it's a new project. Um, sometimes they put us in touch with um, other organizations. Sometimes our alumni go on to have jobs from these um, projects, these capstone projects, and then they reach out to us and say, we'd love to have a capstone project because they know exactly what that in entails. So we've really developed a nice network of, of community partners. Um, I mean, I certainly sometimes just go and call organizations and ask them because I do try to have variety in terms of the projects that are offered every semester. So we typically have anywhere, depending on the size of the class, four to six partners per, per class. And I like to have a range in terms of the subject matter and the populations that they serve, just so that we can, um, the students will have um, choice and flexibility to, to match with the project that's uh, something that's aligned with their interests. Are the red ones newer ones? Yes. Yeah, so the red ones are the ones that were this year. So this was this um, this academic year, Health HIV, which is here in DC, and they really work with organizations and healthcare professionals. Um, oh, that was a project that was on aging and and um, HIV. Capital Clubhouse, which is a very small nonprofit that has programs for those um, uh, recovering from mental illness. American Red Cross. They were a partner for us for two semesters in a row. Um, trying to diversify their workforce. United Way, this was with their human trafficking division. Um, uh, Iona Senior Services, uh, who we and AU have done a lot of work with in the past. They're a great community partner. Um, and Mary Center, and that project was on aging. Most people, many people think of Mary Center as sort of you know birth and women's care, maternal care, but this was on aging. And um, I think the next slide has examples of these project. So this is just, again, uh, just a snapshot of the projects that we've done. Um, and it's, it, we've really, 
have have a wide range of projects from you know this was a marketing campaign that we did this year for Mary Center so that they could raise awareness of the programs that they have for older adults. We've done program evaluations, so those are really great for students that are more interested in research and evaluation work. And this was evaluating Iona's um, in-home peer support program, their pilot program that they developed during the pandemic. So they it was a necessity during the pandemic, and then um, they had such positive feedback, they wanted to get some data and an evaluation to see if they could get funding to expand it. So this was really um, you know, valuable to them. Um, and then a volunteer manual and literature review for the American Red Cross. So what I say to our students and to our, and our partners emphasize to us is these are not reports that go sit on a shelf um, you know, and collect dust. This is, these, are, these are projects that the partners are using immediately after they're completed in a way that really supports their organization and that they use to make decisions. Um, so that's, that's very um, fulfilling for the students to see the impact uh, of their work. I just have a quick question. Yes. So this is definitely project based. Project based. And, you know, obviously, a, a bigger undertaking. Just out of curiosity, in your first year course, is it more direct service or it's also project? -based? Yes. So in our um, introduction to public health course, um, we spend a good deal of the classroom time talking about how to do service learning, what is service learning, how to engage with a community partner, uh, training. <laughs> before we just go out and so in that case they they go out in groups so they're not doing project based work it is direct service but they're freshmen they are new to the university they're new to the city so they go out in groups of 3 or 4 and they um, it's a wednesday class so they go out together they take the metro they learn the city and then they are with the um, organization providing direct service for um, for the afternoon yeah yes yeah. And then we require a CSLP as part of that as well. So they then they have, you know, the confidence and maybe um, can go deeper into what some of their interests that they've discovered at the end of their first year or in their second year to do a CSLP where they select the organization and they go individually rather than in groups. And so we sort of build on um, these experiences, these service learning experiences. Okay, so that's the projects. All right. Um, okay. So I think you have talked about um, the benefits and the challenges um, earlier in the morning. So um, you know maybe some of these things uh, you've you've already thought about um, and discussed. Um, the benefits are you know it's a much longer it's a much longer list. Um, uh, these collaborative relationships, both with us as a department and with faculty and our and organizations and with the students as well. Um, it really is a bridge and a connector for them to apply what they've learned in textbooks into a real world experience. Um, and the, the projects that they've been involved with really emphasize the social determinants of health, which is a focus of our department. Um, and so um, they, see, they see the connection about sort of public health is everywhere. And so when they're thinking about their own career path and jobs, they think it's, it's given them, you know, confidence and um, to be able to explore in a, in a wider range of organizations um, and still be able to think about um, improving health at the community level. Um, certainly interpersonal skills, you know, this is where, and maybe I didn't put this on challenges. So there's working together in teams and there's working together in, uh, with the partners. There's always the challenges with how successful teamwork will be. So we build in, you know, self-evaluation, peer evaluation, check-ins, anonymous check-ins, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings with me on the teamwork side. Um, but I will say on the on the communicating with the partner, that takes some coaching too, because the students are so accustomed to someone saying, this is what you need to do, this is the rubric, this is how I want you to do it. And this is a very different dynamic where the partners are saying, what do you think? What are your recommendations? How do you think we should approach this? We're looking to you. And at the, especially at the beginning of the semester, they're very reluctant. And so there's a little bit of just getting up to speed on um, not just the, the logistics of that communication and initiating that conversation, um, but also being able to express their ideas in a way that seems respectful. 
Um, and so when we have a strong community partner, they're very good at um, bolstering the students in terms of giving the, empowering them to be able to take this project and, it have, and, and it's theirs and it's their ideas and their creative thinking. But that takes time. Um, uh, interpersonal skills, stereotype, perception, and bias. So again, um, we use the community toolbox, uh, tool, toolbox, toolkit, uh, open access um, as our textbook. Um, and again, just reinforcing um, their role in service learning before before they engage with this uh, with their with their project. Um, and then it's just it's just what it's just so rewarding um, the expanded opportunities that these projects often lead to. Sometimes it leads to an internship. Sometimes it leads to an invitation from the partner to present at a conference or to join them for something that they're um, hosting at their organization. To jobs and you know and other ways that when this when the project is over that relationship continues and so. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that come from from these projects that are that are wonderful for our students and for our department, frankly, um, because the the often the partner will send us like job options, job opportunities that we can share, you know, with all everybody in our department because they've um, they know that they uh, that they that the skills that our graduates bring. Um, challenges for sure, it's the upfront time. So this. This course requires much more planning and preparation before the semester starts. Once the semester starts, uh, it, it's really, they're off and running. Um, and uh, we build in teamwork time within the class. Um, I was reluctant to do that at first because I was like, oh my gosh, we have to use our class time for more, you know, more like lecture and, and I had to teach them something. But I kept getting um, feedback from students that it was impossible to be able to find time to meet outside of class where everybody could meet at the exact same time. These these students are so busy. Um, so and then it then you know there was resentment because this one couldn't come and that one. So um, I do build in teamwork time um, into the class. Um, and so it, it again it's a lot of time up front. Um, and the scheduling and just nurturing those relationships with the partners. Um, and uh, but it really pays pays off in, in the end, because when we have strong relationships, then um, again, there's more opportunities for projects. Um, and then accountability on the student side. You know, the majority of the time, these students are eager to do this work, but sometimes there's a student that doesn't, you know, carry their um, weight in terms of contributions. And so having to navigate that, happy to talk about that more if it's um, of interest. Um, it's a, um, you know, that orientation period, they have a lot of work to get um, to learn about the organization and that's on the students. So they have, that's their responsibility to come in informed um, uh, so that they can um, accomplish the project, but they have to on their end understand the organization, what their mission, their goal is. So I have them do a SWOT analysis and a vision, you know, mission organizational analysis so that they really know the organization um, uh, prior to, to, to doing the project work. And even though 14 weeks is a, is a, you know, a whole semester, it's still a short, it's a short time frame. So they have to have deliverables throughout the semester to keep them on track. It doesn't just, it's not just the project is, um, due date at the end, we have due dates throughout so that there are no surprises on anybody's side. The um, partners are reviewing their work and providing feedback. And so by the time it comes to the end, we've seen it all many times. Um, and as I said, there are no surprises. So uh, a yeah. question I have on the professional opportunities, that was something that earlier today we mentioned that there's over 14,000 nonprofits in DC. Mm -hmm. It employs over a quarter of the city's workforce. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, and knowing that you've done uh, oftentimes like alumni panels or um, kind of resume workshops, things like that, what are some of the common questions students have around working within uh, a nonprofit or getting connected to it versus maybe what they're thinking about from like uh, corporate internships or that job fair that they see? every year. What are their questions? Yeah, or what are some of the things that you feel like 
they need salary negotiation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So most of our students um, are thinking about nonprofit work, so not going into the private sector. Um, they know that it's not, it, you know, there are going to be salary differences there, but um, they are eager to hear, and yes, the Career Center comes in um, and talks to them about how to negotiate and if you can negotiate salary. I mean, that's just something that they really um, want help with. And we do, we have an alumni panel and I try to have the alumni panel be students that have graduated within one or two years. So again, it just feels relatable. Um, and those students, that, that's always a question to those students is when you were offered your first job, do you just take it, you know, because you're so happy to have that opportunity or is, can you negotiate when you don't have <laughs> the skills and the and the prior experience. Um, so that's a that's a, a big a big question. Um, and then a lot of our students do go straight to graduate school, which is interesting. Um, so um, you know there are questions about just navigating that process. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Do you any more slides? Um, I've also learned, I think, I, you know, we've covered some of these just in, already in other, um, you know, there's flexibility in all. I think that's really important, not just post pandemic and pandemic that we learned the importance of flexibility. Um, and that's a balance because there are deadlines and we are, you know, emphasizing that these aren't my deadlines. These are now the partner deadlines. This is your demonstrating that you are, um, you know, someone that can, is reliable in the workplace environment. So yes, we certainly um, understand life happens and the partners are generous, generous with that as well. Um, so flexibility is important while also making sure the work gets done and an equality that you can be proud of and that your teammates can be can be proud of. Um, I, I always have to talk to the partners about the difference between an internship and that this is not the same kind of, you know, 210 hours that we the students can just sort of do whatever needs doing and also doesn't require that amount of handholding. I'm very much on the faculty side that is there to be able to make sure this project is progressing so they don't have that same amount of handholding. They're doing check-ins and making sure that expectations are aligned and that work quality is strong, but they're not supervising the same way that as an internship. And they are pleased to hear that. You know, they're they're very pleased to hear that um, because supervising an intern takes um, you know dedication of 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 the of the um, supervisor. So um, we talk about those differences, and that's important to have at the very beginning to just right size expectations. Okay, thank you. All right. Any immediate questions from Melissa, or should we jump into Amanda and then at the end you can ask them both, whatever you want. How's that? Uh, Everybody online okay with that? Okay. All right. And, uh, um, so, yes, I teach community based learning courses in the Writing Cities program and complex problems. Uh, I've been teaching community based learning courses for since 2011, so that's 12 years, something like that. Uh, and half of my teaching load are community based learning courses now. So I teach the complex problems class every semester uh, because it's popular enough now and they have enough interest in it. Uh, I teach the writing course every spring. Um, so, yes, do a lot of community based learning. Mm -hmm. um, I have two models of CDL, uh, and I'm specifically, I'm going to build on some of what Melissa said. I was trying to look at our slides and not have a lot of repetition, um, mostly early college students. So I always think of my courses as a gateway to community-based learning mm -hmm. and to deepening their own academic pathways. Uh, so the Complex Problem Seminar, it's taken their first year of the university, Writing 101. It is the second course in their W1 requirement at the university, uh, second course in two-course sequence. The complex problems course, um, I can pull up that syllabus and show the five different learning outcomes. Um, Vicki had noted earlier, she remembered something about complex problems and integrative learning. Integrative learning is actually a learning outcome for all complex problems courses. We get to go at it in different ways, obviously, um, but it works really well in a community learning course, obviously. Uh, the other big learning outcome that we get at is centering diverse perspectives. And I look at this in terms of course texts and integrative learning, so looking at the community partners' voices, community members' voices, um, what one child, for instance, at Corden's Kids, a tutoring program may want would be different than another child, so it's very much who is in front of you, what are they telling you that they need. 
Um, in the Writing 101 course, it is more research-based assignments focused on community-based learning and social justice. So they do a short bibliography, they do a video annotated bibliography, and then they do a traditional research paper. They choose an issue in community-based learning and social justice. We use actually a list of community-based learning journals, which are interdisciplinary, uh, that CSES and other organizations cultivate. So they are starting to learn about the field of community-based learning, how pretty much any academic discipline can be contributing to this. They get really excited because then they start to see like, oh, my JLC classes or, oh, my site classes, everybody's doing this kind of work. They're just doing it a little bit differently. Um, complex problems. There's a significant amount of communication collaboration with the partner, community members, peers, professor, AU staff. Um, I joke that part of my job, especially teaching first year students how to do community-based learning and how to do it more equitably is teaching them how to communicate when things are working well and when things are not working as well. Um, again, communication skills, especially in writing 101 course, um, it's part of their W1 requirement to learn about different ways of communicating. Um, we focus a lot on professional, respectful, equitable ways of communicating with community partners and members. Um, true story, we did not partner with Thrive DC this year. Uh, and I have a feeling it's because of a student email that was sent last year that was pretty pushy. Um, so I especially- Student to the nonprofit? Yes. Um, so I especially now also look at like examples of emails. How do we do this? The nonprofit is working to support their community members, not you. You should be lightening their load, not adding to their workload. Uh, and then both classes, we do critical academic reflection. There are three major graded assignments in my complex problems class uh, that are academic reflection assignments. So they're reflecting on the beginning of semester, mid semester, and the semester. And they have to integrate a course text and their community based learning experience so far. So at the beginning of the semester, it's a lot more, okay, like we've gone through an orientation or we've gone through a training and here are my expectations. The second reflection is a lot of fun to grade because they realize all the things they did not know before. Um, they feel like they don't know as much as they thought they did, which is what I want them to be realizing. And then the final project our final reflection is actually a rough draft of what their final project for the course will be, which is a multimodal final project about their experience, their personal narrative about their experience. The final project for the writing course, uh, they're synthesizing CBL concepts and personal reflection in a multimodal presentation of their choosing. Okay, so our recent community partners, uh, the complex problems class, that course only partners with Horton's kids. Uh, so true story, uh, part of the reason I was actually, I went to Dickinson College undergrad and I did quite a bit of community service, service learning. I was on their office back then of religious life and community service. Um, and I did not want to do a typical abroad experience. So I actually came to DC for my mm -hmm. abroad experience. And I was Horton's kids first intern in 2005 mm -hmm. when I was in office of um, five well-intentioned white women. Uh, and the office was on Capitol Hill, and it was given to us for free by a lobbyist that our found the founder, Karen Walser, uh, was friends with. Um, so the course, the Complex Problems course, looks at how Horton's Kids has grown over 30-some years uh, to reflect the cyclical needs of the community. And they've also revised and updated their practices and models. Uh, so that course only works with Horton's Kids. My writing class, students can opt in to work with three to four community partners. Uh, so generally, Horace Kids is one of those partners. Martha's Table has been one of those partners. DC Reads. I really love pushing DC Reads as a partner because it also works for students at Federal Work Study, which many students somehow are also not getting enough of that information from the university. Um, plug for first year advisors. Um, we're working with financial aid and DC Reads to get the word out, um, but it, it at least makes service more equitable for students that have Federal Work Study. They've worked with the Family Place before on 14th Street, mm -hmm. Thrive DC and Karis in DC. So I usually, especially with the writing class, try to offer three to four community partners, different issues, different communities. If there's a group that students would like to volunteer with that I don't have listed, we can talk about it. Um, but it also, again, 
especially since I'm working with first year or second year students, generally it does come down to scheduling and maturity. So for instance, some students a few years ago wanted to work with HIPS, but the way that HIPS model right now is they're using a van on H Street and other places in the city at night, late at night between say like 11 to 4 a.m. There's a much longer training process. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, a young man several years ago wanted to volunteer with RAIN, which what brought uh, Rape Abuse and Incest National Network. Fantastic organization, but the training process alone is 40 hours. So also, again, with first year students, I really look at the community partners. What is their training and onboarding process like? Do they have a variety of times and scheduling opportunities? Do they have things that would work well with students' schedules? So, and then... Building on, I say to my students, the complex problem of community-based learning all the time. Um, <laughs> our students do develop a deeper understanding of how complicated social and racial justice and community-based work is in practice and in DC. Um, I've said it a number of times, but generally AU attracts well-intentioned students who would like to build a better world, um, but they know what that looks like online, or they might look, know what it looks like in a textbook, or in their small town from Massachusetts, or even their community in LA but that may not be true in DC. Uh, they build interpersonal communication skills across stakeholders. And I cannot emphasize this one enough, especially at this point in COVID, this is the big thing that has been time consuming for many professors I know. Um, so an example, for instance, we do have the Lyft program to help with student transportation. We had talked about, and I have a Google spreadsheet of like student contact names, numbers, shifts, so everyone can coordinate. They have like a group chat for their day. So for instance, the Thursday Lyft group will meet outside of Leonard. They all meet, lift together. Uh, there was one day that people were taking two different lifts. So my graduate assistant, I saw this and I was like, guys, I understand there might be some interpersonal conflict here between the two students, but the university is not paying for two lifts to the same location for the same shift. So let's have a conversation and work on some of these things. Those two students are now are BFF. Um, actually worked out really well. <laughs> so um, the communication skills is also communicating with the community partners so our students get stressed, especially this is a bigger issue. Um, I have it under challenges too, around finals and midterms. We talk often about, again, they should be laying the community partners load and they need to be depending on the student. Um, so the students learn like their actions, they need to be accountable. Even if they're stressed, they need to look at time management wise, how are they balancing their work? Have they chosen the volunteer shift that works best? Um, sometimes there's a moment in week two or three where students are like, actually, Monday's really tight. Is there a way I could switch to Tuesday? And I'd rather have those conversations early in the semester because it's a lot easier to move people around. Um, the students do develop an accountability and a purpose for this work beyond their grades. They start to understand that the work that we're doing at the university does have meaning to the DC community. Community partners need volunteers, they need research from the university, they need support from the university. They'd love to partner with different departments, programs, classes across the university. Um, so our students really like that aspect. The reciprocity and interconnectivity between DC and the AU and DC community. Um, many students, they anecdotally share that they get told by their classmates, don't go to Ward 8, don't go to Anacostia. Uh, by the end of the semester, I'm always very proud of my students who are mildly angry at their classmates who use language like that. Um, they explain that they don't know actual DC, that to DC residents, to DC natives. Ward three, this isn't DC. Um, but once they start to move into the community, they start to understand how AU does connect and how AU should be doing more to support the DC community. They are developing intellectual curiosity and understand the interdisciplinary nature of CDL. Um, I've mentioned this before, but students are realizing how the research that we're doing connects their other courses. Uh, they can also start to imagine different majors or programs they could participate in. So for instance, I know I actually had a number of students in the program that you're directing. The leadership sorry, program. The leadership yeah. program. Uh, and they were realizing actually this really complements CBL really well. We always have a number of students who are in public health. Um, we almost always have a number of students that start to think about an education major because they've done tutoring with Horton's kids or DC Reads before. Uh, they've started to network with uh, partners and adult volunteers. Um, so especially the nonprofits that do still have adult volunteers that are not college students, they're forming relationships. They're talking to them. Um, I have students who have 
gotten internships just from those conversations that they've built organically at tutoring. Uh, they're also developing more meaningful relationships with their classmates and they're developing a sense of belonging in DC. Uh, I don't know if anyone else reads the Eagle, but there was an interesting Eagle article this spring about how students are now anxious and worried about getting on Metro. And students in both of my classes read it and they were horrified. And their response was, have they used Metro regularly? How are they using Metro? And do they realize like, this is how a majority of the city gets around. It's really expensive and hard to own a car in DC. And that's not realistic for a majority. Of um, DC life skills, I like to say. So navigating transportation, our students are learning about things about why we have taxation without representation on the license plate. They're learning about the push for statehood. Uh, there's always a moment when you have to have a big messy conversation about how DC does not have representation. Some of our students don't actually know this. Uh, they don't understand that DC used to be Chocolate City. And as of the 2020 census, BIPOC people are now in the minority in DC. They are no longer the majority, which is shocking if you know anything about the history of DC. Um, so the challenges, to Melissa's point, balancing the pre-service training and meeting programmatic learning outcomes as much as possible. I try to get at least the initial orientation from the nonprofit during class time. Almost always we have to build in an additional training or multiple trainings outside of class time. We do count that as part of their 20 hours of service for the CD classes. Um, Forms. This is actually something that nonprofits, Kiana from Portland's Kids will probably speak about this this afternoon. Uh, actually, I know she's speaking about it. I love our students, but some of them struggle to submit an assignment on Canvas, let alone fill out a form to get a background check, especially if you're working with children or other kinds of clearances. Uh, so I'm actually in the fall going to make all the paperwork and forms that they need to fill out for any community partner a graded assignment. Uh, because we're at the point where I'm having community partners in March or November still following up with students. And I've gone to the point where I now use the language in email like, okay, we are two months into the semester. This is something that needed to be done. And we were pretty flexible in the first month, but you're creating work now for the community partner. And that's not what your purpose is here. Um, addressing bias and racism in well-intentioned students. It's interesting. Um, Yana may notice this again, but the one thing I have noticed is the difference between my fall and spring, especially complex problems class in the last two years. Generally, we're having more bias and racism issues with white students in the fall class. I think part of this is they're new to DC, they're first year college students, but also the course in the fall is part of university college. And generally students who are choosing university college are looking for something somewhat more special in their AU experience. Um, the students in the spring seem to be more diverse. Uh, they seem to be more comfortable with DC. There are fewer of those issues. So um, many of us are pointing to student anxiety, concerns about white fragility or causing harm. Um, there's been Nabina Nebo, who teaches CAS LEAD, and I've talked about this extensively, but we're increasingly having and in some ways, it's fantastic. We have more white students who are being conscious of the ways that they may be enacting their whiteness um, or even enforcing white supremacy during volunteering. They're realizing the racial dynamics there, but at the same time, they're so afraid of causing harm, then they're showing up anxious and shy. Um, so even in the ways that we're teaching students, I would think it makes me, realize the assumptions I'm making about my students. I would assume if you're signing for a course, for instance, where you're tutoring children ages five to 12, you like children and you wanna mm -hmm. have a conversation with children. Um, we even talked about during our final presentations, like would role playing help? And they were like, well, no, because like what works for one kid doesn't work for the other. And a Pokemon conversation with one kid went completely sideways. And then we had a great conversation about Lizzo with somebody else. So it is very much building their interpersonal communication skills across different groups. Um, and different people. Um, to borrow the Jess Waters line, balancing student expectations, reasonable student expectations and community partner needs. Um, I've had more students asking for hours on weekends and many of the community partners because their staff work nine to five or 10 to six, they're not working on weekends, but students want more of those opportunities. And there are some nonprofits that have those, but if you're signing up for instance, my complex problems course, where students are volunteering in the after school hours, they're not gonna have many weekend opportunities. 
Uh, coordinating commuting logistics, this is in some ways getting easier, especially since we do now have university support for the Lyft Fund. Uh, I encourage you and your students to apply for the Lyft Transportation Grant in the fall when that starts. We'll send out that email beginning of August so everyone can get that split into their Canvas courses. Um, it helps significantly. At the same time, I think the more that we can do to show our students how to do the commute, how to troubleshoot the commute, the better it'll be. Um, speaking of commuting, at times, it does feel like you almost have to be on call for student and partner concerns. Um, so especially at the beginning of the semester, I do the first commute to the community partners with my students just to practice it with them, talk through some things so they feel comfortable. After that, they do it in small groups. Especially at the beginning of the semester, there's more confusion, even as much role playing and playing with different transportation apps in class and practicing all these things, there's always going to be a few bits and pieces there. Um, the last one, which again, it doesn't seem like it would be that much of an issue, students sign up for a course and don't realize it's a community based <laughs> learning course. Um, so this is one thing I I will be completely honest. In my writing course, I've gotten very explicit about this. I have a reading on the day two of class that's talking about language, and race, and racism, and community-based learning, and the problems with community-based learning. It's kind of like my weed out day, if that makes sense, <laughs> because I want students to realize like this is the meat of what we are doing. And if you're uncomfortable now, you're going to get more uncomfortable. And I tell them frequently, part of community-based learning, I think if you're comfortable, you're probably actually doing it wrong. You need to embrace being uncomfortable. It's working better, um, but I think the more explicit we can be in our course descriptions, making sure our courses are coded correctly, and even saying to students to more directly, like, I don't know if this is the course for you. And also, do you have time for it? Yes. So it is an extra chunk of time to travel and everything. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and you would think the ad drop period is long enough, um, <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> students get very invested. I've come to three classes. It's three out of 28 classes now, it's okay, you can switch out, so. Um, all right, so I think Noemi also wanted to add some comments in here possibly, um, but we can also open up to discussion. Yeah, I think Grace too um, yep. has been wanting to speak. Yes, we could go into it. questions first if we want and then go to Grace's yeah. uh, part where we can go into Grace's part now. I Neither of you spoke about the unique governance of the nonprofit within part of the capstone or complex problems that they under, you talked about stakeholders, but understand the role of the board and, and the oversight. And it, it, it's part of what's exciting, but also it makes some of these nonprofits a little bit of an odd duck. Definitely. We have an assignment at the beginning of the term that's an overview of the organization. So they have to understand where do they get their funding? How, who's on their board? Who, how, what the, what's the history of the organization? So they get a, a better sense of who's making decisions, like where this all fits into the larger organization, um, including what some of the challenges have been either politically or with funding or who's making those decisions and what the um, priority is for the organization, you know, the division that they're working in, in terms of the overall, you know, um, uh, leadership. So those assignments are very informative to the students because they have to really dig, especially to follow the money of, 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 of what's going on. So yeah, that's, that's an early. Well, thing. I just know for any board I've been on, yeah. you would grab up a 21 year old like that. Yeah. They express interest in the board. Uh -huh. yeah. and and just to, uh, in case anyone on Zoom didn't hear, Vicki's question was around, do we teach students around the governance of nonprofits and how that structure is a little bit different in regards to board members or funding, things like that? So, especially in the orientation process for any of the nonprofits, they generally talk about the history of the organization, how the organization's evolved, what is the current status, um, especially my complex problems class. Like in the course description here, I link to the Horton's Kids website. Uh, on days two and three of the course, staff comes in and does an orientation. They talk about the way the board works. Uh, they talk about the governance structure. There's an executive director. We talk about the inherent problem of a nonprofit. Uh, part of the reason there is low pay generally, you are not making a profit. So where is your fundraising coming from and how do you fundraise? Um, I've started assigning actually annual reports from each nonprofit, um, especially my COGOD students have loved seeing some of this information. Others, especially my SIS students are sometimes stunned. They're like, well, Microsoft? 
well, yeah, Microsoft, they have money. They're going to donate. Um, so it's a different way of thinking about it. Um, I also think the more text that you can assign from the nonprofit, the better. So I actually assign multiple videos and articles about Corden's Kids or Martha's Table or DC Reads to students in the first few days, partially so they can choose the nonprofit that works best for them, but also partially so they understand the actual governance structure a little better. So I don't know if that helps. Other questions, Alyssa? Is there a writing 106 communication writing class or just 101? Just 101, is, the uh, accelerated uh, course, yeah. Uh, uh, not right now, no. Other questions from anybody online? If not, I, I would love to hear from Grace because I think student experience is like a whole nother thing yeah. we need to hear from. Grace, you want to join us? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me on today. Um, Before you I start, a little bit about yourself, what class you took and, you know, what year you are at AU. <laughs> Um, sounds good. Um, so my name is Grace Government. Um, I'm a junior here at AU, um, studying public health with a minor in math, um, and I was a community-based research scholar during my first year, year first year here. Um, I, as part of that program, I took um, a complex problems um, seminar in the fall, as well as a community-based research lab that instructed um, my group in community-based research um, methods and principles. Then in the spring semester, I was Part of a community-based uh, research course uh, that was partnered with the Anacostia Riverkeeper and conducted um, community-based action research um, in collaboration with them, um, the, uh, with a local nonprofit, the Anacostia Riverkeeper, on pollution in the river as well as um, community members' relationship to the river. Great. I wanted to um, let everyone know that I added a link on the chat to the site that Grace's class created under Dr. Rebecca Hazen's supervision. Dr. Rebecca Hazen was the biology faculty member who taught that class, that section for the CBRS students to do the community-based participatory action research. Um, so Dr. Hazen couldn't be here today, so we're so grateful that Grace can be here to tell us about their experience. Grace, um, I do. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, just one question I had: Are you pursuing the certificate as well? Um, yes, I am. Um, in addition to uh, the CBR coursework, um, the, it goes very well with public health coursework. Um, so I'll have completed that certificate very soon. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the research? As part of biology, did you all have one community partner, the Anacostia River Keepers, or multiple community partners? Uh, we did just ha uh, we had this one community partner, the Anacostia River Keeper. Um, I also have a brief slide deck as well, um, going over the project, if that would be of interest. Sure. Yeah. John, let me make you a co-host so you can share that. OK, go ahead. Um, the, um, like um, other presenters have said, uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, this, um, I I just have the slide deck here for mostly organization. This can be informal. <laughs> um, so the Anacostia Riverkeeper um, was our main pro um, partner throughout the project. Um, it was a one semester project. Um, so the way the partnership worked is that. Um, ARC came to us um, with re with kind of a research aim of like, you know, what they were trying to, hoping to understand by the end of the semester. And then we collaborated with them using our learning we had gained it during the fall semester to discuss how to best um, explore those um, research aims. And so ARC gave us a previous report they conducted on fishing in the Anacostia River, um, both in terms of pollution and community relations and attitudes. Um, and so overall, we came out with, um, with two overall aims for the project. Uh, first, to understand um, the source of ongoing fecal matter in the river, despite um, city renovations to the sewer system, through collecting water samples and preparing them for future QPCR analysis. And then our second goal was to understand who the stakeholders are in river health um, and their interactions with and trust um, with the river. Because they've arc realized that even if 
the city were to take action on remaining pollution in the river, the community may not benefit um, from those changes as the community has been harmed and destroyed across generations, often in acts of white supremacist and um, colonial settler colonial violence um, meant to disrupt community um, dis disrupt communities. So, um, so I wanted to give an overall overview um, of how the project went. So this was the semester where the first three weeks were online. So we took those three remote weeks uh, to really understand the history of the river um, and its connection to the community, um, its pollution, um, its connections to uh, systems of power and how uh, both the government and nonprofit, um, nonprofit organizations relate to and care for the river today. We then, once we were back in person, um, met with the Anacostia Riverkeeper, uh, discussed with them um, what the project would look like, what the work that they're currently doing with the river and their water, mo water monitoring project, um, and then really outlined what the rest of the project was gonna look like. So we then split um, the us students, we split into three groups, uh, a field team, a lab team, and a survey team. The field team um, went out to the river along four main sites um, and collected water samples and brought them back to AU uh, for analysis by the lab team who then prepared them uh, for qPCR analysis um, they then also um, took the observational data of temperature turbidity uh, pH level and analyzed that into analyzed and compiled that into a report uh, the survey team then built a survey um, based on that previous report that ARC had given us and uh, distributed that survey, analyzed that data, and uh, presented a separate report on community outreach. Um, and then finally, um, um, like Dr. Nchatayi put in the chat, we put together a website uh, for ARC that compiles our background methods, um, findings, and recommendations, and pre presented it to them over a virtual um, reporting and conclusion session, because again, it was during the pandemic. Um, so each team had their own standardized methods. Um, we were, the survey team in particular was the one that I was a part of and could speak the most to. We were trained by our TA prior to going to, out into the field. We also collected uh, via audio and via notes, um, any informal interviews, with participants prior to and after completing the survey. Um, that was also part of our final report. Um, and then we completed um, data analysis and visualization in, in Excel and R. Um, that website that Profe linked in the chat um, gives a pretty good overview of what our uh, overall findings and results look like. And I also wanted to um, just highlight some of the CBR and action research principles that were included in the project. Um, so in terms of, so democracy, equity, um, liberation, and life enhancement are were all some of the main principles of CBR and action research that were presented to us in the fall semester. Um, and I feel like we really achieved this through um, having a community-led research focus and investigation method and recognizing community members as experts on the situation they live in. So really having those informal interviews being uh, primary to guiding the data analysis um, was really um, important. And then also obviously having community members decide the modes of investigation and the research goals. And then also um, really building community capacity and, tra and transferring resources and power uh, to ensure to really give community members and highlight, highlight their voice um, and equip them with any um, tools and resources they need to continue their own um, projects that they that they themselves guide. Um, so, so we were supporting ARC's already go already ongoing water sampling monitoring through having students, you know, have that take that transportation time, you know, have that water um, be equipped to like um, take those samples and really add to their data set. Um, we also then provided them from the survey team, a clean data set uh, for analysis and statistical software, as well as a survey kit 
um, with standardized survey data collection um, and in order to support uh, future community-based participatory research so that we could give them our Qualtrics survey, we could give them our survey kit, and then they have a tool and a standardized procedure so that they can rec recruit their own community members and really have this be, and really continue this project um, and be fully community-led. Um, and I feel like this has really shaped my approach as a researcher um, going into my um, sophomore and junior years. Um, because um, CBRS is a first year program here at AU. And so I'm from Oregon. <laughs> so moving 2000 miles was a new experience for me. I was in a place I'd really never been before. So I was on the survey team and I was very much focused on the data collection side. So that involved me, you know, mostly going out towards seven and eight, um, also a little, some sites in Ward 5 as well. Um, and walking up to community members and asking them to take our survey. And so that really led to genuine candid interactions with community members, their thoughts on DC, their thoughts on the river, really anything they were willing to share. And so I've, I've had, it was a very genuine exp like experience of being able to hear people's thoughts and being able to record it. Um, and, going, and then I also kind of took a lead role in the survey data analysis and so really hearing these people voice these people's voices, hearing what their wants, hearing their experiences, both joyful and regretful and wanting in terms of their relationship to the river, I felt accountable of delivering um, to the to the nonprofit organization these people's voices. And I knew that once the semester semester ended, the semester ended, and you know, there wasn't a guarantee that the project you know, we continue with them after this. So I felt accountable to be on a deadline and to and be able to communicate the needs of these people I had talked to in person um, to this community organization and really build consensus among the community towards what were the next steps that needed to be taken. And then um, it really provided me with a humanizing and not hierarchical approach to research. Um, so when I went on to take uh, courses like health research methods, fundamentals of epidemiology, I had this um, lens with me when I was um, getting into more details of other research methods and thinking how would I how would I apply these principles to this type of research? How um, could we really value and highlight community knowledge here? And um, especially as I um, am trending towards working more on the data science side of things. I'm currently doing data visualization analysis for another DC community org. Um, being having this opportunity to really talk to members of the community in their day to day life um, has provided an approach of I'm not just working with numbers. I'm not just doing. I'm not just putting R and Python code onto a screen and making results pop out. This has I in my work. I'm genuinely accountable to a community and creating change that is benefiting everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Okay, we're going to just take five minutes for questions and then we're going to take our 30 minute lunch break. So questions for Grace or Melissa or Amanda or Noemi. Anybody? I have a broad question. I don't know if it's appropriate to ask now or another point in time, but mostly about, I'm interested in developing a course that kind of focuses on this more about the upfront, like faculty end before you start the course. Like, how do you really develop that partnership, build up those projects before the semester starts? More about like, how, how are you initiating everything? I wanna give a quick, a quick one and then anybody else can answer. Everything you've heard has been faculty setting up the partnership in advance, okay? That works very, very well. It is a lot of labor. Not everybody does that. In other words, we have back there, I don't know if you saw nonprofit directories, we have like 20 different directories. If you're looking at Latino organizations, if you're looking at affordable housing, if you're looking at youth and education, we have lots of nonprofits and contacts. So sometimes, like when I taught my course about Latinos in the DMV area, I said, this is a list of whatever, 20 Latino nonprofits. If you're interested in immigration, you shouldn't use, you know, 
outreach and we give kind of a draft template of an email, you can reach out to the group and do that. So that is another option, which is a little bit less burden on the faculty, even though clearly it works really well. We also have a brunch in either the last week of August or the first week of September, where we have 10 or 15 or 20 nonprofits come in and you get to meet them and we try and have them broad, you know, so some are environmental, some might be working on food security. So you have an array of groups and you can talk directly to people. And then that's followed by like community partner fair. We do a community partner fair for students and faculty in the fall and in the spring. So that another way to do that connecting and networking is available. So you're right. If, I, if hearing them, it's like, wow, that's daunting. That's a lot of work you're doing in, in August or whatever, but that's not the only approach. I would just add, I mean, I think it can be really helpful to talk to faculty who have been teaching in community-based courses and just one-on-one um, -on -one hear like how to align your ideas with a CV-based course. I know in our advisory board, we've talked about actually explicitly like mentoring faculty who are interested to just help you along the way and in any way so that what you're creating meets the needs of your students and what your vision is. Um, but that's not formal, but I think anyone who's been teaching in a CV course would be willing and, you know, just to talk to you as you're, mm -hmm. as you're coming up with ideas. I think it depends on what your course is mm -hmm. and how you could connect the nonprofit to the, uh, the learning objectives or learning outcomes that your own department sets. Uh, I think especially if you have an ongoing relationship, like I've worked with Gordon's kids since 2005. Um, I started partnering with them the first semester. I taught community-based learning courses, but the partnership we had in 2011, 2013, 2012 looks completely different. It's a completely different beast than what it is now. Um, some of the partnerships that I've formed over the years with Martha's Table, DC Reads, Thrive DC, um, even DC Central Kitchen, when I work with more with them or Latino Student Fund, it's been word of mouth. Um, CSS or other faculty members connecting me to somebody. So a little bit of it is the networking that we naturally do in DC and at AU. Um, but I do think if you're trying to figure out which partners could work, come talk to one of us. We're happy to help you out. Can I will chime in briefly because I have to run, but um, I'm gonna use the example that Grace described, the Anacostia River Keeper. We had a professor, Rebecca Hazen in biology, who graciously agreed to teach for uh, the program for CBRS. So we needed to find a partner that would be relevant for her expertise, right? Her expertise is in environmental issues related to uh, her biology training. And that's why I spoke to Marcy and her team, and they told me about Anacosta River Keeper who they learn about through Amanda Chunka sitting in the room with you there. So Amanda, thank you for that connection. That's how we learn about ARK. And um, we set up a meeting in the summer with them to plan to see if having a group of students doing research for them would be something that they found uh, of interest and beneficial. And so they told us about how they could use research uh, for their, um, objectives and Grace has told you the rest of it and how uh, this worked out so well for them and they want us to come back and do more so we'll have to think about how to do this uh, for future semesters at any rate I'm sorry I have to go I have I'm on uh, transportation duty today have a great rest of your afternoon everybody Bye. Bye. any any other questions for Grace Melissa Amanda Yes, I have one question for Grace, and if it's already been asked, then I'll get caught up during lunch. But uh, I know you mentioned that you were using R and Excel to do your analysis. With your capstone, are you planning on using R? And I also just want to say how amazing it is that as an underclassman, you've now trained yourself on a statistical software that a lot of people never get the experience to uh, to use. Um, that's a really great question. Um, I, uh, I believe Dr. Hawkins actually um, talked about a bit of the public health capstone experience um, a bit earlier. And I would love to use R <laughs> um, if that is if that is a role I could take on in um, during that course. Um, and um, in terms of um, R in this project, um, statistical software in this project, it was actually 
uh, the opportunity ended up working really well. I took like one LinkedIn learning course over winter and break between that fall and spring semester. Um, and it provided me with um, enough skills to be able to do the descriptive analysis um, necessary for this project, um, though I had to teach myself a bit more um, during the project itself. And I, but I just thought doing so would let me provide a better quality product on the kind of um, tight COVID affected deadlines we were um, running on. Grace, are you taking Capstone in the fall with me? Uh, I'm not, no. Um, say sometimes when I know the students, I try to um, reach out to partners and projects that are aligned you know, yeah. with their specific interests. But when you do, we can talk and we can try to find a data analysis project. So oh, that would be great. We take a break in a minute, but the afternoon we have two partners who will share with us how they work with AU students, what were some of the benefits, what were some of the challenges, and we'll, we'll delve a little bit more into the community partner piece because that is, like you said, so important. It can be labor intensive or there are different approaches. Any final questions for anybody online? Okay, so we have food here. It's it's 12:40. We're going to take a break till about 105, something like that, 25 minutes. So people can eat, chat, and then uh, we'll get you set up for our, our partners. We'll put you in together. Okay. We'll get to who we're going to speak. So one more out of the way.